On Wednesday nights, we have been talking about making room for the Lord specifically really ministering about pursuing His presence. Everybody say His presence. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's the abiding presence of the Lord, but there's also the presence where He comes in. You could call it an anointing. Uh, the glory of God, the manifest presence of God. Uh, that's what's so important about peace. Peace is the manifest presence of God. Strife is the manifest presence of the devil. So you always want to kick strife out, get rid of strife. Don't, don't allow strife, whether you got a company or a business or a staff or whatever, home, you want to get rid of the strife. Praise the Lord. But we have been talking about it. won't go back and, and rehash everything, but... Um, Several weeks, uh, I don't know, we had a good prayer night um, a few Sundays ago um, when we have all church prayer, and I was just really, we really had a good, got over in the spirit, and I was praying a few things out, and kind of stirred me in some areas, and we're talking about making room, and so some things kind of came out that I was making note of, and uh, actually, you know, just uh, look, uh, this is not in my notes, but if you have your Bible, uh, I just feel led to look at uh, Psalm 84, I've mentioned it. But Psalm 84, anybody hungry for the Lord? You know, I believe in these days as we're talking about making room for him, really what we're talking about is uh, our, our fellowship with God, our prayer life with God, where we're just slowing down a little bit and making sure you're taking time. Um, we've been looking, gosh, probably the last three, uh, this is part four tonight, is I'm just building, uh, continuing until we just, you know, if I get on something, I just go until I, I, I kind of run out of, you know, the, the track runs out and it's time to go into something else. Um, but, you know, Isaiah 40, 31 uh, reveals to us the benefits of those who wait on the Lord. And we've looked at that verse, they that wait on the Lord shall mount up. Those are benefits. They mount up with wings like eagles, run and not get weary. They walk and not faint. And, and we are exchanging our weakness for God's strength. You know, the Bible tells us to be strong in the Lord. Uh, you could say, you could also say be strong in the word because you can't separate God from the word. So you could say be strong in the word. That is, to be strong in the word is to be strong in the Lord. Did you catch that? But, but something jumped out at me this last week. You know, in Ephesians 6.10 there, Paul said be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We spent several weeks talking about the might of God and, and uh, stirring that up and walking in the might and the strength of God. But, but that really jumped back out at me again because he, he wasn't just talking about being, he's not just talking about being strong in the Lord and, maybe, and in the word. You could say, but also in the spirit, be strong in the spirit, in the power of his might. So there is a might that God is, and he wants us to be strong in the might. Or you could say in the spirit. So be strong in the word and strong in the spirit. So how does that happen? Well, that's because we have a relationship with him. And uh, so we're, it, it begin, everything begins in the word. I mean, we're going to know God through his word. John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life that we know him. So knowing him is not just getting to heaven or having eternal life. But eternal life is actually knowing the one who is eternal life, the one who is resurrection and life. And so uh, Psalm 84, right here, let me back up. I like this psalm. He says, how lovely are thy dwelling places. Uh, do you think of the presence of God or maybe even, I, I always think of the church. I love the church. I've spent my life, you know, growing and pastoring. And but I think when I come, I'm always, sometimes I walk in in the morning, if I'm by myself in the prayer time, I'll say, oh, man, this is, here's my, here's my, here's my, here's my place, you know. Uh, I like to pray in here a lot and uh, have over the years. But he said, how lovely are your dwelling places. What makes the dwelling places of God so lovely? He, it's him. It's him. Oh, Lord of hosts, my soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. That means your soul, your emotions, your emo if, you're, if you don't get emotional for God, you're not doing it right. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I'm sometimes, because especially, you know, you see people kind of new or, or they, they kind of come to church and they just kind of got their hands folded. They're not really, I mean, I mean they're kind of frozen chosen a little bit, you know. Uh, but you're like, dude, if you're, not, or if you're not getting your soul, you know, if you can go to a ball game and get excited and shout at the basketball game or the football game or whatever, but you come to church and you're not excited about Jesus, there, there is movement, you know. There's, some, there's something about, he said, my soul Longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. I mean, man, how about I like to have a church that everybody just comes in and, man, we're just singing for joy to the living God. 
I mean, that's, that's what David's talking about. And he goes on and he says in verse 4, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They're ever praising you. So it's, I don't know, he's either talking about, and he could be talking about, you know, we're dwelling in, because in, I'm going to go to a scripture here in John 15 where he talks about dwelling. But, but this could just seem to be someone who really just loves, the, I love church. I love God. I love being where, where God is. And, and, and those that, that like that, they're blessed. And they're ever praising him because why? He's good. And he says, how blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways of Zion. And we were preaching off this uh, passage, you know, on Sunday morning a few weeks ago, talking about, you know, he says, passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. That's, you know, that's, that's repentance involved. We live a life of repentance. Did you know that? That's why I ministered on healing on Sunday morning because I was at a conference. I did a couple, I went to a couple of meetings last week. Uh, saw my grandkids, but while I was out there, there was a prayer conference that I went to. And, um, and I was so stirred um, while I was, I was just sitting there and what, had nothing to do with what I was really hearing, but I was so stirred. I had to repent because I felt like, I mean, I've, I've, done, I've done healing crusades in different nations. I, I've preached healing in this church. But, but I was so convicted that I have not magnified Jesus concerning who he is as a healer like I should. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, oh, Lord, I re-. and when I repented, I still feel it right now. The anointing came on me strong. And I said, Lord, first, first Sunday when I get back, first Sunday I'm in the pulpit, we're, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to talk about you and what you do. And you're a healer. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So that's why we're going on that way Sunday morning. But, I, but I, um, man, I was just like, I have not magnified him. Who is Jesus? He's the healer. Amen. New Testament, he's the healer. Man, God, God heals in the Old Testament, but I'm New Testament. Jesus walked and healed and delivered and set free. And um, so that's where we're going. But anyway, so I was thinking about that. And he, he talks about, goes on here, they go from strength to strength. Everyone appears before God in Zion. And, O Lord, of God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of thine anointed for a day. Look at it. A day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I'd rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God, now this is like this, Psalm 84, 11. This is a good verse. Remember, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. What does he do? He gives grace and glory. Anybody need some grace? Anybody want some glory? You know the difference between light and glory? Light will penetrate darkness, but glory penetrates deep, gross darkness. Remember Isaiah 60? Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. And, there's, and the light, and there's deep darkness shall cover thee. Glory penetrates deep darkness. And we don't just want to walk in light. We want to have glory. Praise the Lord. So the Lord God is a son and shield. He gives grace. Think about it. He gives glory. That means when the glory of God's on you, it's noticeable. It's recognizable. And that will affect every area of your life. It'll affect your, glory will affect your finances. I mean, if you just talk about glory, that's a, one aspect of the glory of God is he'll financially, he'll financially impact you. Praise God. That's a whole other message. But no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Oh, Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in thee. So we're talking about just hanging out with God, making room for him, really just developing a hunger, greater hunger. I'm just trying to stir us up, really talking about our prayer life and the purpose of it, really, waiting on the Lord, wanting to spend time with him. That's part of our prayer. That's how we get to know him. And so we need times where God develops us. So with that in mind, he was talking about dwelling here. Let's go to a New Testament passage in John 15. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out the Amplified this is John 15, verse 4. Dwell in me. This is what Jesus said. Dwell in me. Everybody say, in me. Now, if you're saved, I thought we were already in him. Well, sometimes people are toggling back and forth a little bit, and I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll get to that because I kind of got into that last time. So, dwell in me, and I will dwell in you. Live in me, and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in being vitally united to the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. How many want some fruit? It's clear. Jesus said, if you want fruit, you got to abide in him because it comes out of you. You can't make it happen. It comes out of you. Fruitfulness comes out of our relationship and our walk with him. We'll, we'll, you'll, so just keep that in mind. We'll kind of swing back that direction. You'll, hear, you'll see what I'm talking about. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever lives in me, lives, that's a lifestyle. You're living in him. You're conscious of him. You have a relationship with him. He who lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. I like that. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. 
Verse 6, if a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire, and they're burned. Verse 7, if you live in me, abide vitally united to me and my words. Now, watch this. And my, so how, here we have a, a bit of a picture, a piece of the puzzle of how we abide. If my words abide in you, what happens is, notice, my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts. Ask whatever you will, and it'll be done for you. Why? Because when his word's abiding in you, it's almost like you're asking for him. You're just, you're just asking for what he already said he wants to do. And that's important because God doesn't do anything automatically. You have to ask. God's, God's will doesn't fall on you like cherries on a tree. You have to pursue him and pursue the will of God and do the will of God and Like we said earlier, walk in faith and receive the promises. They're not automatic. Again, that's another direction we could take off. But here's the bottom line. If prayer, and this is what we're talking about. Jesus is talking about abiding. If prayer is more of a duty than a delight, you'll never get what I'm trying to communicate to you. What I started into last time and where I'm going tonight. If you don't see prayer as a... As a delight, it's got to be, you have to see it, because a lot of people come in, the, oh, they're, they're thinking of it more, more as a duty. If it's duty, you go into it with a cold heart, trying to satisfy a religious requirement rather than a, del, than a delight that you're something that you're enjoying and a heart of expectation of, you know what, I'm going to have fellowship with God, because he said, if I'll draw near to him, he's going to draw, draw near to me. So you come, you come, the Bible talks coming in with some confidence before him, with faith, coming before him with a sincere heart. So time with him, we said, shapes the pattern of our living. It shapes us. It works in us. A changed life is the product of time spent with him. That's pure, I mean, so uh, that's why, and, and we're going to, I'm coming to this, this uh, I, I begin to give you, and I'll get to it, I gave you these perspectives, three different perspectives, and I'll get to back to it. A person living in a perspective of, of kind of just the, the soulish realm, the, the, the selfish life, the carnal life, they're saved, but they're living carnal. It's, this, this, this person's really not going to, they're, they're not growing, they're not developing like they need to, and it's going to hinder them. So this is where we fellowship with, we learn to know him. So here's the deal. Daily prayer, daily time with God promotes devotion to God. You're getting to know him. You're learning him. You're learning to recognize him, and it keeps him in the center of your heart. That's, what he, that's where he wants to be. He wants to be in the center. And so we said what, what overwhelms us shapes us. So that's important because you can be overwhelmed by the circumstance and that's going to shape you. Or it's kind of like pressure. You have to have more pressure on the inside from the Word of God than there's pressure coming at you from the outside. People crumble when the pressure from the outside is caving in or the world is coming in and crashing in. You got to know those promises and the promises have to create more pressure that, that call, that's called faith coming out of you, that you speak to those circumstances. You declare the word in, in the face of that. You, that pressure causes you to praise God because, you know what, I'm not going down. I'm going up. Praise God. You know, and so I'm going to thank God and praise God, and I'm going to keep my eyes focused on him. Does that make sense? So that's why we said religion can't shape you. Religion can't shape you. And so many people go from unsaved to religion. That's what happens to so many people. They get saved. They don't get in the Word. They don't understand the importance of getting in the Word, developing, renewing their mind in the Word. They go from, they go from unsaved to religion instead of relationship, and so they never change. We see, this is not, our Christianity is not something of the past. It's something that we, this is, this is a relationship. God wants covenant. God wants relationship. And it's so vital. And I know that sounds almost cliche because everybody knows, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we're supposed to have relationship. But, but, but it's reality. And without relationship, we dry up. Without relationship, without abiding in him, we don't produce fruit. And you don't want to be a fruitless Christian. You want to be a fruitful Christian because if there's no fruit, you start getting pruned. Well, God's going to prune you anyway because he wants more fruit. I mean, there's going to be some pruning, but, but you don't want the kind of pruning where you get cut off and thrown into the fire. I mean, that's, that's, I'm not interested in that kind of pruning, Right. So the problem, and I said, I mentioned this last time, the problem with this is well-meaning Christians start trying to, and this is, this is so important, and I hope you got it last time and you get it tonight, well-meaning Christians start trying to live for God. See, the person that gets into religion instead of relationship, they're trying to live for God instead of from God. 
And I'm going to kind of just give you, I was just sharing some thoughts and just kind of move along with some of these thoughts going, see, you want to live from God. Everybody say from God. So back to the illustration that I began to get into last week, people basically live from three different perspectives. Just basically real quickly, you got the world, you got saved, but maybe even filled and defeated. They're just living soulishly. And then you have the spirit-led life, the spirit-filled life. So let me just walk you through these again. We talked, number one, this first perspective is simply the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus came to preach. We know, we know Romans 14, 70 says, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So there's relationship. You understand who you are. So remember Jesus, uh, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom first and his righteousness, his right way of doing things. And all the things of the world, the things that you need, will be added to you. So there's the kingdom. It's, and, and we just, just simply, if you take a note, the kingdom of God, it's the spirit life. It's the spirit-led life. It's the life that I'm living from God, not for God. It's not religion. It's relationship. It's not convenience. It's covenant. All right, it's a big difference. And this is not, see, the, this is not sin management. I told you, it's glory management. See, the person that's living the self-life is more soulish, flesh-ruled, carnal. They're saved, but they're carnal. Anybody know any? Be, you know, anyway, yeah. you don't have to raise your hand. But that person is, they're operating, they're, they're trying to manage the sin. It's sin management. Yeah. Yeah. Always trying to, how do I overcome? I'm, I'm, you know, and, and we're back and we look like the, we, anyway, go to church, but we look like the world most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right? So that's the kingdom of self. So you got the kingdom of God, and you got the kingdom of self. They're in the kingdom of God, but, they're, but really self is more dominant. It's, it's the soul. It's, it's, the, it's the mind, will, and emotions. They're saved, but they're carnal. They're soulish. Masses of people, multitudes of people living right here in this, from this perspective. And these people toggle. You know what I mean by toggle? You know, they used to use the word toggle like a computer. You could go from one, one, one thing to the other thing, you know, on a computer. And I know what I'm talking about. So it's like that. And spiritually, people toggle from the flesh or the soul realm to the spirit. One minute, Peter told Jesus, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. The next minute, Jesus is rebuking him, saying, you're thinking the thoughts of man. Get behind me, Satan. So, it's important. so it's, don't think that it's, you know, y- y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you can be having your time with Jesus. Oh, I love you, Lord. And you, you, can be, you can be in the kingdom perspective, and all of a sudden something happens, you get a, and next minute, you, you, now you're responding from the soul. You're responding from the flesh. And you're like, man, how did that happen? Well, it happened. That's because you have the ability to go from one to the next. But the goal is learning to live the spirit-filled life. And that's when, when you're the more spirit-led life and spirit life you live, and the more you live from God, when you get squeezed, the more the good comes out. And the fruit of the spirit comes out. And that fruit is coming out. So not, not everybody who gets saved has fellowship with God. Right? We talked about it's like a family. You can be in a relationship and not have fellowship. So living in this kingdom of self is the soulish life. This person's operating off of their mind, the will, and emotions. Is this God? Is this me? And they haven't really quite, it's almost like God, you ha, they have to filter everything through, through the soul and, and their emotions, and everything's more emotional. You're, you're not supposed to be dominated by emotions. I don't care what time of the month it is. Okay. I'll just move it right along right there. I'll just leave that alone right there. When you're operating in the spirit life, the kingdom perspective, the spirit is dominating. All right, I'll back up. I'll I'll back up on that. Because you just because you had a bad day. That doesn't mean you got a right to live in this soulless area and just respond in the flesh. Okay, let's just put it like that. So, but you're living from this kingdom perspective, living from God, the spirit's dominating. But when you're flowing from the kingdom of self, and you'd be surprised how many people like their self. The soul is dominating. Hallelujah. What's supposed to be the dominant key? We're led by the Spirit. The Spirit will lead you. He'll bear witness with your spirit, not your soul. Not, now, there'll be things that come up in your, you know, and your mind gets it. But God's leading you in here. And that's where you got to learn to hear from. And it's where you learn to live from. So if the majority of the body of Christ is living carnal and soulish, the kingdom of self, no wonder we're not impacting the world. The world's actually influencing the church. 
So the problem with the self kingdom is even though it's saved, it looks a lot like the world. And that's why the temperature can look like the world. It's just out there. Hallelujah. So then, so you got, you, you got the first two so far. You got, so you got the kingdom of God, living from God, spirit life. Then you got the kingdom, this kingdom of self where I'm saved, but I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of staying carnal, flesh ruled, soulish. I've got a will, but I'm having a hard time submitting my will to God's will because I'm not renewing my mind. And so I just, my will kind of sides with the flesh because the flesh goes where, what's the most dominant? Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the soul, the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion makes the deciding vote. So you got to renew your mind. So this, so we're talking about this, this self kingdom, even though it's saved, it's looking like the world. And so, so you got the kingdom of the world now, and, and those are just the masses of people that are lost. They're in the dark. Most of the world, a lot of people, unsaved people. And so it's our job to influence them. So I mentioned as we were about to close, the purpose for revival, the purpose for the presence of God. That's what we're after, right? Are we after his presence? Anybody after his presence? Man, like David said, man, as the deer pants for the water brook, my soul Longs for you. So, so now, my, now I'm, I mean, there's, a, there's an emotion involved with that. I'm pursuing him. I'm expecting something here from him. But the purpose for revival, or let's say the rain, why do we pray for the rain and the latter rain? We're praying for the rain. It's to get us into the kingdom of God perspective, living from the Spirit. Kind of like Brody mentioned Sunday morning, you're marked by God. You want to get to the point, you're so, you're so marked with God, you can't do anything but flow from God. Flow out of him. So, I mentioned this, the root system of the kingdom of God, the spirit life, is love. What's the root system? It's love. Learning to live, God shed abroad his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So, Ephesians 3.17 tells us we're to be rooted and grounded. Rooted. Are you rooted? Grounded in love. So the root system of love, the reason that's so important is because it takes us back to Ephesians 1, verse 4 through 5. In him, he pre in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ. In other words, you didn't start when you were born, when you breathed your first breath, and then God loved you. He, he knew you before you were in your, when you were in your mother's womb. Jeremiah says, you knew me when I was in the womb. So you actually started in the mind of God before you even came into this world. So you can say like this, you started in glory, but sin made us fall short of the glory. And the reason Jesus came is to restore glory back to us. Jesus, remember, read John 17. Father, thank you. The glory you've given me, I've given them. Everybody say glory. glory. So there's a whole lot in that statement. Would you read it? Go back and read it. Jesus said, the Father, thank you. The glory you've given me, I've given to them. God restored the glory. There was glory in the garden. Man, are you kidding? They walked naked in the garden. They were covered in the glory of God. But Adam sinned and all have sinned and fall short of the glory. So Jesus came to get it back for us. Praise the Lord. Man, so here, let's move forward here. So when I'm living in this perspective of the kingdom, this spirit life, and this is where we kind of mention it. This is, this, is, this is where you have, this is the hard work of rest. So this spirit-led life, if you're going to live in this area, and what Paul first begins in Ephesians is you got to learn to sit. you got to learn to rest. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, let me just take a side thought here because uh, this is not in my notes here. But if you look in John, everybody knows John 14, 1. Everybody know John 14, 1. In my Father's house, let not your, actually, you started, let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house, well, actually, let me back up. I'm not quoting it right. Let not your heart be troubled. Notice he said, believe in God. Believe also in me. Why would he tell us to do that? Because it's going to require faith. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Now watch this. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Everybody say a place. Now we like to think, oh man, that's my mansion in heaven. It could be. But I'm telling you, you want to know really understanding more of what your place is. Your place is the seat that Jesus went to go prepare for us. It's the seat, because we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus, I go to prepare a place. Where's the place? At the right hand of the Father. I'm seated with Jesus in heavenly places. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you might be also. 
Praise the Lord. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. That, that's the place. That's a seat. Praise the Lord. And if you go over to Ephesians 1.20, look at Ephesians 1.20. Praise the Lord. And then we'll get back to our, our deal here. Ephesians 1. I'm sorry, this is not in my notes. So, Estelle, if you're upstairs thinking, oh, this, I, didn't put, I didn't do this here. Ephesians 1.20 says, which he brought about in Christ. These are things that he wants us to know that he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subject under his feet. And he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's his presence. He fills all in all. Hallelujah. So the place Jesus is talking about is the place in him beside the Father. And don't you know, you got a nice place. That's why you're, when you pray, you're, play, you're praying from a seat of authority. You're praying from a seat of victory, a place of victory. You're, you're, already, you're already on top. So you're not trying to get there. And I'm going to go somewhere with this. Watch this. Now stay with me here. Because this is important. So this perspective, when I'm living in this perspective of the kingdom, I'm, 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 I'm living from a place of rest. See, the spirit life is where the plan of God comes out of you and you're not struggling to find it. It comes out of you. Everything that God has talked to me, most of them, I heard it on the inside. He told me what to do. In prayer, talking to him, he gave me instruction. Pretty much most of what I do, everything I've done, started this church, that church, where I go or even where I'm involved, certain things, He's leading me. He's quickening me. And it comes from the inside. There's lots of stuff you don't get it from your head. We want to know it, but you got to get quiet. You got to seek him many times as you're waiting on him. And he tells you things that you weren't even expecting to get. Hallelujah. So this is, this is where the spirit is resting on you like it rested on Jesus. Remember the Bible says when Jesus came up out of the water and he was baptized, it said the spirit descended on him like a dove I mean, you just see, you kind of see the picture. There was a picture there of the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, just kind of settling down on him. Well, from this place, like I said, you, I can be worshiping. I can be, in, I can, you know, just be enjoying my time with Jesus and the presence resting on me like a dove. And then a few hours later, some circumstances arises and I look from the wrong place and now I'm sitting with the pigeons. Hallelujah. See, pigeon religion is different from the spirit life. Pigeons make a lot of mess. <laughs> and most people living in the kingdom of self, here's the deal. When you're moving along, most people want, they, from the, they want a visitation. But when you're living from the spirit, you can have habitation. Why would you want a visitation when you can have habitation? Spirit life, you can have habitation. Habitation is where he is constantly before you and you hear his voice. Like Psalm 16, 8, David said, I've set the Lord continually before me, and because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So you, 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 you set him. That you're, you're living this way. Habitation is where you're experiencing his love. You're experiencing his love. I mean, whoo, you, you experience him because he is love. And in the kingdom of self, you deal with love deficiencies, and that means you have God deficiencies because God is love. You know, you have love, if you have love deficiencies, you have God deficiencies because God's love. And if you got God, you got all the love you need. Hallelujah. And so the kingdom of self, this soulish, this carnal area, guess what happens when you're living from that point? It's fear based. It's fear based. See, when you're in fear, you have to have control. That means I got to have a bigger stick than you so I can control you. Why is that? Because. I'm in fear, and I, I need control. When you're in fear, you need control. And the kingdom of God, the spirit life, is about freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberty, right? So the kingdom of self, this carnal life, we're more aware of failure. And so the enemy's working. And then next, we get these feelings that, the next feelings that come is forsaken. We're feeling alone. The enemy's working, and you feel stuck. And then the next feeling is being overwhelmed, and we just want to live depressed, and we don't want to do anything. And now we just want to say, Jesus, just come quickly. Come quickly, Jesus. But the church, the spirit-led life is here in go, church. Go. Go. See, when I'm living from the kingdom of self, I see how big Goliath is. When I'm living from the life of the spirit, I see how big God is. It's totally different perspectives. 
See, when you live from the soulish realm, when I touch the sick, well, I might catch it, so I don't know. But when I'm living from the spirit realm, when I touch the sick, they'll be healed. Because I'm living from God, not trying to do it for God. I'm not trying to get something from God. In God, I have everything I need. Hallelujah. This is a whole different way of living and loving. And when you live from the soulish realm, you're focused on what I don't have. And when you live from the spirit life, I see loaves and fishes. Who do we need to feed? Different perspective, right? I said, when, when you're living from the soul realm, all you can see is what you don't have. But when you're living from the spirit life, you see loaves and fishes, and who do we feed? See, the kingdom of God perspective understands it's about sons and daughters. But when you're operating from the kingdom of self, you're living from a perspective of an orphan. Totally different life. See, we're not orphans anymore. You, you might have been an orphan. When you got saved, you were adopted. See, that's the beauty. When you go back through, the, through these New Testament epistles and what, God's, what Paul is talking about, we've been adopted, purchased, adopted. See, John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. I'll come to you. And too many churches are operating more, operating more like an orphanages than a healthy family. But, fool, if we can start operating like a healthy family and know who we are, orphans compete with one another. Sons and daughters complete one another. See, God started with the family, and he's going to end with the family from every tribe, nation, tongue, language. See, when I'm living from the kingdom of God, when I'm living from him, and I'm living this spirit life, I'm anointed. When I'm living from the spirit or from the perspective of self, I'm annoying. So you can be anointed or you can be annoying. <laughs> See, when I'm living from the spirit life, I'm prophetic. But when I'm living from the self life, I'm pretty pathetic. <laughs> Hallelujah. When I'm living from the self, I'm working. It's more like, it's more like the Tower of Babel. They were working. They're you know, building something to the heavens. You know, I'm trying to make a name for myself. But when I'm living from the Spirit, it's an open heaven. It's my Father's house. And I'm doing it from Him. I don't have to do it for Him. Yes, my faith is involved. But it's from Him. Living from Babel and seeing yourself as an orphan, you're looking for validation. In other words, in the orphan world, you have to do, and then you have to have, and then you become, or I become. Lucifer was the first orphan. He got, he got kicked out. He, he's an orphan. And his greatest nightmare is that the sons and daughters are going to come home and have intimacy, and out of that intimacy comes identity and stepping into inheritance because inheritance are for sons and daughters. It's a big perspective here. The self-life is about convenient, convenience relationship. The spirit life is about covenant relationship. See, Christians living from the self-life are frustrated. We've had prophecies maybe spoken over us. We've seen some promises, but we don't have the wedding band on. People, a lot of people just on another date with Jesus. The spirit life rests on covenant relationship, and all the promises of God are yes and amen, and I'm married to him. Intimacy, because I'm married to him, now becomes accessible. I'm one with him, and I know it. The self-life barely understands the robe of righteousness. And this was coming out in prayer. That they, 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 a lot of people, they don't barely understand righteous. What, what is right? They think maybe I got to grow in more righteous or I need to be more righteous. You can't get any more righteous than you are in Christ today. But, but a lot of people barely understand the robe of righteousness. And, and, and they get to heaven because they're righteous. But without the ring, heaven will, will get in you. Without the ring, heaven will not get in you. The prodigal son got a robe. The robe gets you to heaven, but there was also a ring. Sons and daughters becoming one with him, and the ring gets you to heaven. Let me say it like this. The identity is in the robe, but the authority is in the ring. That's why the prodigal son got both. He got the robe, and he got the ring. I said the identity is in the robe, but the authority is in the ring. <laughs> You can, 
I'm, some of those might be on the app, on the notes. I don't know. I don't know what I put on there. Praise the Lord. Everybody say, my identity is in the robe, but my authority is in the ring. And the ring gets heaven to me. Hallelujah. See, the ring gets heaven to, to me. It's, I know who I am. Praise the Lord. See, the kingdom life is lived in humility. God gives grace to the humble. The kingdom life is lived from the tree of life. The kingdom of self, this soulish person is focused on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, one perspective is living from heaven towards earth. The other is living from earth towards heaven. We're supposed to live with heaven on the inside. The kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom will be in you. And it comes with power. See, it's not being overwhelmed by the world. It's being overwhelmed by him. The kingdom life, the spirit life understands we win the world with love, not anger. Right? That's how we win the world. Jesus said the world will know you're Christians by our love. So the kingdom of self, this soulish life, what happens is it goes after the world as a lion. Ooh, we got to be a lion. Well, the only problem is, is 1 Peter 5, 8 says there's another lion, a roaring lion in that realm who seeks going about seeking whom he may devour. But there's, there's a whole other perspective here. In the kingdom perspective, there's a lamb. And he's the one we're to be like. If you go to Revelation, actually four times Jesus referred to as the lamb, one time as the lion. And guess who whips the devil? It's the lamb. It's the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. So, it's being like the lamb. Hallelujah. What crushed the enemy was the lamb. Praise the Lord. So, how do we live? How do we live this life? Well, we're, we're, we just want to develop a relationship with God. So, we're learning to live a spirit. Isn't that what the New Testament teaches? Live the spirit-led life. Everybody say spirit-led. Where I'm living from him, not trying to produce something or for him, but it comes out of my relationship with him. Hallelujah. I got a robe. I got a ring. Hallelujah. I know the lamb. He's the king. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can lift my voice and I can sing. Sing praises to him. And learn to just come close to him and draw near and learn to fellowship with him. He's real. Praise the Lord. It's not just a little, you know. I mean, we all get busy sometimes, and um, we want to rush in, rush out, you know. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Got to run. Got things to do. Can you help me out today? Praying on the run, but, but it's learning to just devote time to him, waiting on him. Hallelujah. Remember those things... The plan and following the will of God for our life, it comes out of that walk with him. Because he wants us, the Holy, Jesus said in John 4, if you read John 14, 15, 16, a lot, of, a lot of John's gospels really toward the latter part of Jesus' ministry, especially, I mean, the 14, 15, 16, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and he wants to show us things to come. He wants to reveal things to us. He's really talking about, again, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to come again, and you're going to know the Holy Spirit. He'll only be in you. He'll be with you. So it's developing our relationship. Basically, Jesus was telling the disciples back in John 14 there, Jesus was, was he, he's kind of like the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and he's basically preparing, preparing the disciples for, listen, a new life, which means I'm still going to be with you. You're just going to have to use your faith. You're not going to see me. I'll be there. You're just going to have to use your faith and know I'm with you, and I'll always be with you, and you can live from me, not having to pursue me and try to seek me and find me, and hopefully you'll catch up with me one day. Praise the Lord. He said, I'm going to be in you. Well, if somebody's in you, you would know it, right? How many ladies you ever been pregnant? You, had, you knew something was in you. You know something's in you, right? <laughs> well, you should know somebody's in you. Stand up. Hallelujah. Let's just thank the Lord. Maybe we'll, hallelujah, flow in some more of these things here. Praise the Lord. Did you learn anything? Get anything? Pick up anything? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, it's not religion. That's, if you didn't get anything else, it's not religion. Religion's working. 
Faith is resting. It's, faith is a rest. Did you ever read Hebrews, Hebrews, tell, Hebrews 4? It says, faith is a rest. And God rested. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Over in Matthew, what is it? Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You'll find rest for your soul. Rest is important. Resting in him. Waiting and exchanging our weakness for his strength. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for the word tonight. Thank you for your truth that sets us free. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have uh, a Christianity that gets stale and old, but it's something that's vibrant and living because you are a living God, and you're living and abiding in us, and you desire, you desire fellowship with us. You delight for us to come to you and take time with you. And so, Lord, help us to stir up our hunger for you, to just develop and grow in our faith, that we're not looking for a feeling. Hallelujah. We're just, we're, we're, you're looking for true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. And so we're just coming in to honor you and to just hang out with you and just to love on you and sing to you and minister to you. Hallelujah. Come on, just sing that out loud a little bit more, Jensen. This is, this is how I thank the Lord. Hallelujah. I will sing. Come on, let's just sing that before we go tonight. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. When I was weak, this is how I thank the Lord. For everything, this is how I thank the Lord. And this is how I thank the Lord for loving me and keeping me. So I will sing, this is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for saving me. Saving me. When I was weak, yeah. I was sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. And I will sing. I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing my praises to you. I will sing, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, say, I will praise you, Lord, more and more. I will thank you, Lord, more and more. The Bible says, come into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Praising him, magnifying him, thanking him. Hallelujah. And the cloud of his goodness will settle on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us, loving us, working in us. I was thinking about Ephesians, what is it, Ephesians 2, 13, for it is God who is in you to will, in you, say he's in me, to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's in me. Come on, say it again, he's in me. Praise the Lord, he's in me to will and to work for his good pleasure. Wow, that just simply means we just have to kind of pay attention to what's going on on the inside. Hallelujah. Live from the inside out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, you glad you came tonight? Well, do some time. Spend some extra time. Maybe in the morning, find you some time in the afternoon, whatever. Just spend some extra time just waiting on him and just singing to him, loving on him, praising him, and, and just kind of work. You know, maybe, maybe that's a little difficult depending on how long you've practiced or done it. Maybe, maybe 10 minutes and you're like, I'm done. Well, start stretching it a little bit, and you'll get to where, you know, I've got to have time with him. I've got to make time for him. I've got to make room for him. Make some room. Make some room for him. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, I'm glad you came tonight. Bless you guys. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful night, everybody. You're dismissed.